Welcome to the New Books Network. I'm Caleb Zachran, Assistant Editor of the New Books Network. Today I'm speaking with Thomas Mullaney, Professor of History at Stanford University. We're discussing his new book, The Chinese Computer, The Global History of the Information Age. Tom answers the puzzle, how did a language with tens of thousands of characters adapt for modern keyboards? How did this transformation take place, and what are the implications? Tom, thanks for joining me today on the New Books Network. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to see you again. Of course. Yeah, great to see you. And and I think it, it, it's interesting going from reading a, a book that you wrote about how to do research and then reading one of your books uh, where you actually demonstrate the, those research <laughs> techniques and skills. Um, yeah. I think I think one thing that is very clear is, you know, you're an extremely organized writer. You're very good at, at I, I think, uh, creating a very clear, clear structure for how you're going to go about things and then going and actually ushering and marshalling the best the best evidence and clear explanations for that so i think I you've taken it you've taken a topic that i'll be honest i didn't know anything about beyond just seeing friends who you know type in mandarin occasionally seeing that their keyboards look different than my uh, standard english language qwerty keyboard uh and you know curious to see how how, how that developed and it, it is quite an interesting story but before jumping to the book, I just wonder if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Sure, sure. Um, so my name is uh, Tom Mullaney, and I, I've been teaching at Stanford in the history department for 18 years now, which is pretty amazing to to tally up. Uh, before that, I did my PhD in history at Columbia University. I'm an East Coaster, came out here. I finished at Columbia, came out, started as assistant professor in, here at Stanford, have been here you know, ever since. Um, and, uh, gosh, I'm, a, I'm a father. Uh, we have, uh, we have two young kids and, um, I spend most of my working hours thinking about as much as I can about research, whether, if, uh, you know, you mentioned, um, whether it's, it's helping others learn how to undertake research or, uh, to engage in it myself, because, you know, to me, it's, it is just uh, one of life's greatest joys um, is to engage in the research process. That's uh, you know something that I think uh, New Books uh, New Books Network listeners will uh, understand. They will they will uh, they will definitely relate to that 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 deeply. And I think research really is uh, the process of research is so exciting. And you know that's why I always like to ask you know how did you sort of come to write this book? What were the archives, source materials, other burning questions that you had that 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 guided you in this effort this book used to be one book um and part of the uh the chinese typewriter a history a book that i published a few years ago on mit press and uh, all told between those two books i've been working on this for about 15 years i think by this point and probably about Maybe three years before I published the Chinese typewriter, which, if I remember, came out in 2017, it sort of hit me. Um, I had, with permission, done a simultaneous submission to MIT Press, Harvard University Press, and UC Press, and said, you know, I, with with permission, said, would you be interested in reviewing a proposal for this book on the history of Chinese information technology in the, in the modern era? Um, and they had said yes, and all three had made offers on the book. And so, you know, things were getting real, so to speak. And it hit me like a ton of bricks that if I kept down my current path, one of two things was going to happen. Either it was going to take me 20 years to write a thousand page book that <laughs> that no one wants, um, or I was going to end up sort of shoving the history of computing into one of those altogether dis- unsatisfactory chapters that we tend to see sometimes in books that it's just, you know, hurry up and get it done kind of chapter. And I had I had spent so much time already in, in the side of post-World War II Chinese computing that I really did not want to do that. I really didn't want to give it a short shrift and do injustice. And so I decided to be a little bit cheeky and brave. And I wrote to, um, I wrote to, I believe, to MIT Press first. And I said, what about a two book contract? Like, would you consider if I sent you the whole manuscript for the Chinese typewriter history and then a brief proposal for the Chinese computer, 
would you consider a two book contract? All three publishers agreed to that. And then MIT Press sort of upped the ante and said, we'll make it a three book contract. And that's that's the, the third book became uh, an edited volume that I was lead editor for called Your Computer is on Fire. And so once once all that process was done and I signed the book contract, this three book contract, I then took what now is the Chinese computer and just clicked and dragged it into a separate folder and decided to sort of come back to it once typewriter was done. And, um, and so I've been, that's just a long way to say I've been working on this since 2008, 2009. And amazingly, a lot of people, it's, it's funny. I've, I've had this come up actually two times just this month. Um, I was out for a talk somewhere and then I was meeting with a visiting scholar and, uh, you know, they don't, they, they know me or they don't know me. Um, and independent of one another, their assumption was that I joined Stanford university, Stanford's in Silicon Valley, and I sort of picked and chose a computery type topic and it was very career strategically wise, et cetera, et cetera. And I, I sort of have to politely say, wow, you are dead wrong <laughs> about, about this. Um, it's a book that actually has its origins in something that happened to be in grad school uh, over 20 years ago. And that sort of festered and stayed with me the way that research often does and simply had to wait until I was done with my first book, which was on the categorization of ethnic minorities in Southwest China. And so it was, it actually emerged out of a completely weird and unrelated thing to Silicon Valley or the history of technology, so to speak. It came from my obsession with, um, disintegration and disappearance and ruin and rot and uh, extinction and so forth that sort of planted its seed in my consciousness over 20 years ago. It's kind of a long-winded story. I'll, 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 I'll kick the ball back to you before I just launch into it because I don't want to eat up. Please do. Them. I, I mean, well, I, 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 I'm, so, I'm so curious what, what you yeah, mean it's, disintegration it's, I, and rot. <laughs> yeah, so, so I came back from, I came back from the archives in Southwest China as a, as a PhD student. And I had found amazing materials. Um, and I use note cards. I, I, um, I take notes on whatever I can take notes on as a first phase, but then my process is I then transfer all notes to library card note cards. I have, if you could see my office right now, it's, I have library card catalogs all around me and that's how I wrote. So I, I eventually get to a place where it's one note, one card, one fact, one uh, one passage, one quote or whatever. And then I have this special class of cards that I call bib cards, like bibliography cards. And um, and these are obviously the things that are going to end up in my footnotes and bibliography. There's a code, a sort of short code I put on the top of the right of that card. And then the other note cards that are from that same source, I just write that bib that bib note card, uh, the, the, the code on the top of it. And I was, um, I don't know what, what it was, but I was traveling a lot. I lived in Brooklyn at the time. I did music back then. So I decided to live close to my uh, practice studio and my bandmates. And I commuted to New York. To, I commuted to Manhattan a lot on the subway. And I don't know, my, somehow my thoughts turned to like, what happens if my backpack is stolen? What happens if my bag gets lifted or with my note cards in it? Or what, you know, what happens if my apartment burns down? And it's amazing how fragile... Uh, all of this work that I did, you know, these really these smoking gun sources that were going to make or break my dissertation, um, they're they're so fragile in some sense. And then it hit me the sort of second punch, the one two punch was, wait a minute, I don't need my whole apartment to burn down. All I need to do is to lose one or two bibliography cards, like the smoking gun sources that really make everything. If I just lose those bibliography note cards. Suddenly, by the rules and regulations of our profession, even if I have a thousand note cards from that source, they all become inadmissible evidence because I can't cite them. I can't tell you where it's from. Neither do I have the capacity to go back and find them. Probably if I try to go back and find them, the archivist will realize, wow, I shouldn't have given it to this foreigner in the first place and never show it to me. And then suddenly everything in my dissertation that's really given life by these two smoking gun sources, or I'm just using that figuratively. It's done. Like my career, and then like my career, my you know my graduate program, and I just I started to really think. And this is not new. I mean, I think a lot of people think about the intrinsic fragility of stuff. Um, 
but I started to really fixate on on uh, the question not of not of the fragility of life in the sense of life and death, but more of the fragility of information, how things come into and fall out of formation. And I, it just it started with thinking about these note cards. And so, you know, I put that aside. That was not relevant to my dissertation. It was just something that was coming up in me. What what Chris Ray and I refer to as a problem. This was an emergent problem in my mind that I hadn't put words to. So I kind of put it aside. I wrote my dissertation. Uh, I, tur- I, went, I got the job at Stanford. I came out to Stanford. I finished it. I put it into a book. But then I wanted to really think about this. So I put together a speaker series at Stanford called How Everything Disappears. It was a speaker series where I invited different scholars from different fields to come and talk about their terminology, their conceptual frameworks for how things fall apart. So I I brought in a conservation biologist to talk about extinction, Um, an historian of thought to talk about how concepts die. Um, One of the proudest moments was when I convinced the, the now or then head of the excavation of the ruins of Yin, this is like where the dragon bones were found in the early 20th century in China, but it's still an ongoing excavation site. I brought in the director of that to Stanford, but I had very clear instructions. I said, listen, I know everybody else wants to hear about what we now know about Chinese history by virtue of what we have found. I don't care about that for the purposes of this. I want to know how it went into the ground. Because as we know, it wasn't like a, a snap of the fingers and it was gone. It took centuries for this stuff to ruin. And that's what I want you to explain, if you can, to our audiences. How does a, how does a capital ruin to where it's there, it's there, it's there, it's there, it's gone. Um, and so this was a speaker series though. So everyone, no one was, it wasn't a conference where everyone is in the room at the same time. So the only people who provided any continuity to it was my grad assistant, who's now Professor Yair Minsker, um, and myself and a few like hardcore kind of uh, disappearance junkies. They were like at every show, so to speak. <clears throat> and so it was my job at the end of the speaker series to give a kind of capstone. And the capstone piece was How Everything Disappears, very bravado title. And so what I was going to do was sort of keep, take themes that had emerged in these interdisciplinary conversations that no one besides this core group had ever seen. And one of the themes that emerged over and over and over again was that while we're trained to think of disappearance as acts of book burning, acts of destruction, acts of genocide, acts of these sort of... um, One is that there is this intransitivity to the vast... The vast majority of disappearance is is really an intransitive verb. The, The vast majority of books that we do not have are not because they were burned. It's because they were... They are remaindered and go out of print and mold and mildew and disintegrate, libraries disintegrate and so forth. So dis, the, the intransitivity of it was one theme. And the other was that um, production is generative of disappearance. So, you know, simply put, the moment that the camera is invented, the moment the moment you can take a photograph of a person, retroactively, it means you do not have a photograph of everyone who is before that time. And so there's this weird way in which we lose things at the moment of production. Uh, and so production is sites of production are sites of disappearance was another theme. And so I just, I had to give it like a shape. Obviously I had to give it an empirical shape. So the shape I gave it, which I care about because I love language. I love writing in particular. I focused on the case study of um, so-called lung pizza in Chinese, rarely used characters. These characters, I found this amazing dictionary when I was in a bookstore in near Tsinghua University one time. And it was a dictionary of rarely used Chinese characters. And quite literally, you would pick up the, open the book and the entry would have some Chinese character. It's like right there in front of you on the page. And next to it would be definition unknown, pronunciation unknown. Next one, character, definition unknown, pronunciation unknown. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is incredible. Like it's here, it's in front of me, but it's also not it exists, but it is not extant. And that essay had this tiny little like preface that tried to give its explanation of some of the dynamics by which a character can just go out of go out of circulation, so to speak. Um, and so I used that as 
the basis for that conversation. And I was getting ready for the talk and getting ready for the talk. I was like, okay, sites of production or sites of disappearance. Okay, that, you know, like movable type Chinese. Like, you know, does uh, do the characters that are in the movable type set tend to be printed more than ones that are not. And maybe that's a question of sites of production and sites of disappearance. And then in Chinese typewriters, and then I sat back in my chair and realized like, are there Chinese typewriters? Is there such a thing? I've never seen one, is there? And then I began the process of just Googling and I found Google patent documents and things. And within, a, with, within matters of moments, I was just smitten just absolutely and these these moments in research that i don't think we talk about in these terms it is love at first sight this is i i don't know why i want to get married but i want to i don't know why at this moment i want to spend my life with you but i do and the rest of my life is both hopefully spending my life with you and being able to put into words why i want to but from that moment on that was the beginning of both the chinese typewriter and the chinese computer and what ends up being your computer is on fire. And it came out of um, a journey, which is still ongoing. I have a contract for this other book now. It's a journey towards the book that I actually want to write, <laughs> uh, which is this th reflection on um, on disappearance and disintegration. So the, the, it's the, but now, you know, people are, people tend to be kind of economical in their thinking. They're like, oh, he's at Stanford, Stanford, Silicon Valley. He seems like a strategic thinker, so he went out there and chose this techie topic. And look, it paid off. And uh, it's like, nope. <laughs> uh, it emerged as a as a weird, um, almost accidental byproduct of a pathway towards a project I've been the one project that I've been working on longer than typewriter and computer, which is a reflection on 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 uh, disappearance, and that it became you know, my companion, a meaningful companion. I mean, again, it was love at first sight, but it's also, it's also in some sense a vehicle towards um, thinking of this new problem that I have. It's almost the, uh, you found the perfect case study for answering a broader philosophical existential question for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think that it, there was something about that moment. I mean, maybe this is something that, that, um, Again, that my colleague Chris and I, in, in the other book, Where Research Begins, we talk about a lot is, you know, this, what is the existential irritant? What is the problem that seems to be propelling and motivating research? And in that book, we talk about problem in the singular only because it is true that, you know, that one's research problem is not a passing fancy. It's not like something you just read in the New York Times. It's it's more continental drift scale. It's People have a problem for 10, 20 years sometimes. But what we don't talk about, and we talk about it a little bit at the end of the book, is problems change. They, 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 and one can be kind of in between problems. And I think maybe what happened at that moment when I discovered um, Chinese typewriting and Chinese computing is I was, I had one foot on the problem of world making and technology and language. And that's actually the same problem I had in my dissertation in my first book, although on the face of it, they seem like very different books. And then my other foot was on this new problem, this new continent of disintegration and disappearance. Uh, and typewriter had nothing to do with disappearance. Compute The Chinese computer does. There is a very long, because of hypography, there is a, there's a very, very just direct relationship to the ideas of ephemerality and um but uh yeah i think that probably i was i was right at the intersection in my own life between two problems now one of them has let, lost its grip on my heart and the other one i it still has a grip on my on my heart to to set up some context for this this project of looking at at chinese computers and type uh can you can you tell us what the standard is for today. So if someone mm -hmm. pulls out their phone or someone opens their computer, what is that experience of typing like for them? Yeah. So if we start with a laptop, um, well, let's say you go to the Apple store and you buy yourself a MacBook Pro and you go home and you're anywhere on earth. You're in Shanghai, you're in Cairo, you're in you're in Mexico City, you're in New York. Uh, um, you come home, it's the exact same machine. Like it is out of the box, it is the exact same machine. And preloaded on those machines, and for that matter, any Windows machine, um, preloaded are 
what are a set of computer applications, software applications known as input method editors, IMEs. They are simply in like the settings section of every computer in the keyboard section of every computer. And if you go there and you, you say, I want to add a keyboard, what you're really doing is sort of loading up into loading up into memory, so, so to speak, um, an input method editor. And so what an input method editor does is um, even though your actual physical keyboard interface on your machine will look the same pretty much. I mean, maybe the symbols on top of the keys will be different. But in the case of Chinese computing, even at least in mainland Chinese computing, the symbols on top of the keys are just QWERTY, Q-W-E-R-T, and some, some, maybe some additional symbols. But what the IME will do is it will sit in the background um, of any computer application you're actually using. So Microsoft Word, web browsing, writing an email. And what it will do is every time the user pushes a key on their keyboard, on their QWERTY keyboard, the IME will snatch that up, look at it, analyze it, and try to um, use that information to figure out as intelligently as possible what Chinese character is the user trying to produce. In in the twenty in the twenty first century, um, the vast majority of all input method editors will perform this analysis using um, one or another pinyin phonetic system. So this is a, a system developed in the 1950s that uses the letters of the Latin alphabet, developed in China by Chinese linguists, that uses the letters of the Latin alphabet to describe the sounds of Chinese characters according to the standard dialect. So, you know, take the capital Beijing, two characters, Bei, North, Qing, capital, um, and it's in the, 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 the formal pinyin spelling of it is B-E-I-J-I-N-G with the accent marks over the correct correct vowels, uh, correct uh, um, vowels in there. And that's the pinyin sound. So one could sit down at their computer, turn on the Chinese, the, the pinyin Chinese IME, um, and uh, or download one. They're free from various companies, Sogo, QQ, pinyin, Google, um, uh, Google, Microsoft has one. And then you start typing B E I J I N G. But every keystroke you do, like B, you type the letter B, the IME is already up and running. It's like this little anxious friend that's like, ooh, B, okay. This is a phonetic IME. So what this user wants is a Chinese character that begins with the pinyin consonant value of B. That could be thousands of characters at that point. Uh, but the second that the person types E, the IME little anxious friend goes, oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. We can rule out all of the characters that have a B, you know, B-A, a B-U. And now we're just looking for one that is B-E. And then every subsequent letter that you enter, it's helping the IME refine a set of what I call candidates that it then um, presents back to the user in this little pop-up menu on the screen. And says, like, basically, if it could talk, it would say, is this the character you want? Are these, is the, is the character you want among those I'm presenting to you right now? And because it's uh, sophisticated, it won't be just a random presentation of Chinese characters that fulfill that criteria. It will be sorted by statistical frequency. The more common characters that have that pronunciation will be sorted first and, and then on a diminishing frequency. And if the user sees the character or the two character compound or maybe in a multi-character string if it sees the chinese character that they want it's it uses either the number keys the space bar or the enter key and i guess you could use the mouse but you're not going to do that for speed it says yes i want number two in the list you've just presented me two i'm going to push the number two and as soon as that confirmation active confirmation has happened that character is committed to the screen be it, be it microsoft word or your email or web browser and then the pinion, and then the IME says, "Okay, I'm ready. What's next?" And the 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 pop up menu is blanked out, and it's and it's ready. What do you what do you want next? And so this the entire process for using a QWERTY keyboard to input Chinese characters is this circular kind of cybernetic loop, this feedback loop of you provide criteria, you get candidates back, and then you confirm which one you want. And this. Um, if you were to use, there are other ways to do it. There are other, uh, you could pick up your iPhone. You could still use a QWERTY keyboard and do the exact same thing. 
but you could also use your finger and swipe at the keyboard in which you are actually writing or producing a kind of a picture of the character you want. And But the process is the same. It is analyzing the um, the stroke or whatever that you have done, and it is saying, okay, out of all the Chinese characters in my dictionary, which one fulfill the criteria of the structural criteria that I'm being given for what's one? But it's still the same feedback loop. So that feedback loop is dramatically different than how an everyday Anglophone, Francophone, uh, Chinese computer. I mean, for that Russian language, Italian, German, Hebrew, the list goes on and on. There, for for a very large number of of computer users on planet Earth, that process, that feedback loop, sounds <laughs> sounds um, cumbersome. Sounds sounds like amazing when you describe it in that basic way, because for for these other computer users, especially in the Anglophone world, the whole model that we've been sold, kind of hook, line, and sinker is what you type is what you get. If I want a symbol to appear on the screen, I will look for that symbol on the interface and I will push that button. And I fully expect that if I type H, H will appear. U, U will appear. One, one will appear. And yeah, there are some exceptions, accents or whatever, but the vast majority of the experience is supposed to be what you, what what is, the pretense is that it's immediate. It has, it's immediate, it has no mediation, but of course it does. And so, the book is one exploration of where does this come from? How does it work? How how have people conceptualized how it should be governed and how it should be conducted? And um, and what are the outcomes, not just for the realm of Chinese computing, but digital writing as a whole? And I try to make the argument that um, uh, we've reached a point in the present day when arguably the global majority of computer users, not just in China, not just in the Sinophone world, but the majority of computer users globally use their QWERTY or QWERTY style keyboards much more like it's used in China than is used in, say, the Anglophone world. So now that we, we've reached a point in human history where the majority of computer users are actually using something along the lines of this cybernetic loop for, for human computer interaction, um, and that the, the realm of immediate what you type is what you get is actually the global minority. It's it's incredibly counterintuitive, and anytime mm -hmm. something is is counterintuitive, it means that there's usually an interesting history behind it. Chronologically, you you start in the 1940s, looking at the earliest forms of digital Chinese type. Uh, can you tell us about the, these uh, this, this kind of early beginnings of of moving the uh, Chinese language onto uh, computers? Sure. Yeah. So in the the first chapter of the book is there's a very interesting story to that. That that was one of the chapters where the first it begins with the story of the IBM Electric Chinese Typewriter from the 40s. And so in theory, it could have been in the previous book, the Chinese Typewriter, but by virtue of the fact that it's electro automation, then uh, so for a long time I debated whether or not that should be the final chapter of the previous book or this one. And um, and then the world basically uh, mercifully said you were the, you made the right choice because uh, when I published the Chinese typewriter, it came out. I had the, the IBM chapter was not in it. And it was only thereafter that I found the up that I got, had the opportunity to interview who becomes the main character of chapter one, Lois Liu, who just recently passed away very sadly, but at a very late age after an amazing life, you, could, you couldn't imagine a life better led. Um, but uh, if I had published them, I would never, I would have regret, regretted it so, so much because it, it would have come too early. But um, back to the question, the, the first chapter is about the, the IBM electric Chinese typewriter, which is co-developed by a, um, the Chinese American, eventually Taiwanese American inventor, Gao Zhongxin, and uh, and then his colleagues at IBM, mainly Chris Berry and Eugene Bueller, uh, under the sponsorship of the IBM Corporation. And it is uh, it's an incredible machine. It's an incredible machine. So it is an electroautomatic machine in which uh, one would sit down at this device, this tabletop device, and on the keyboard of this machine, there are no Chinese characters. There are four banks of numbers or banks of keys and those keys only have arabic numerals on them uh and so 
sitting down at this machine and then and then out of sight you can't see it it's just inside the machine is a uh, a metal drum that is rotating i think at 60 revolutions per minute and on this metal drum are etched in mirror image for printing purposes something like 6000 chinese characters just about 6000 chinese characters and the way and then you would spool a piece of paper in just like you would with a mechanical typewriter uh, an english language typewriter you would spool it into place and then by depressing one key from each bank of keys, so four keys in all, so a four digit number, you would enter a four digit number on the on the on the on the keypad, and then boop out would pop a Chinese character printed onto the page. What this means is that in order to use this machine, one would need to to the best of their ability, completely memorize by heart the four-digit codes for somewhere in the order of 6,000 Chinese characters, which you know, sounds like an absolute impossibility. Uh, and I, what I spend time in, but per, turned out not to be, long story short, turned out not to be. There are multiple characters in, in, in the story, but two I focus on in particular, Lois Liu and Grace Tong, who did it, who, who did this. Uh, and uh, and there are, there are others in the story who, in their own way, did it as well. But what the the main point of that um, chapter and the sort of thing I explore is this question: How much code can a human being stand? You know, there's that very famous study about what is the maximum number of digits that we can memorize. I think it's like seven plus or minus two is the very famous name of the article, which makes the argument that you know seven digits. Like the phone number, seven-digit phone number is about as much as we can handle in our cognition. Um, there are, there are, of course, people who I don't know. Uh, first responders have to learn. You know, we've got a seven hundred two. We've got a seven hundred three. Police, police dispatch units. We've got a, we, we've got a seven two three in progress. At you know, grocery clerks that have to know what the code is for kale or broccoli. Um, we do have many different professions that work in what I what I refer to in the book as real-time coding, lucid coding, kind of like lucid dreaming, um, which I make a distinction between lucid or real-time coding and say crypt, cryptanalysis, you know, like the bomb or, uh, you know, people, people at Bletchley Park trying to decode the Nazi code or the Japanese code or something. This is different. This is not code that you have minutes or hours or days to try to decipher. It's a code that you need to metabolize not just not just think about it. you have to metabolize it almost instantaneously that that you, it, you can almost think of it as sight a musician sight reading music and not missing the beat and so the question is is like how much of this can can a, can the human stand who is not a savant let's say uh and so this inventor gao Zhongqin, he builds this machine he invent he 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 develops and conceptualizes and then in very entrepreneurial style, begins to try to get partners with precision engineering firms like IBM, Mergenthaler Linotype. And beyond the just the tech of it, the hardware of it, the, the actual thing that he had to convince the world of was that this is humanly, cognitively possible. And you have to imagine that from the perspective of the engineers at IBM and also like the president, like Watson Jr., um, and, I, and I trace through all of their private correspondence with one another, they just have a hard time imagining that this is humanly possible because, well, it, first of all, it's just surprising on the face of it, but even more deeply is that they are operating within an Anglophone information technological environment in which it would be completely absurd, asinine to even dream of asking a user to do this. Because again, all of these sort of um, incredible game-changing technologies of the last, say, from the 1800s on, were all invented in the Anglophone world first and then extended outward. And so they were they were cellophane wrapped from their inception to the needs of the Latin alphabetic world. And 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 so they're sitting there in IBM and saying, wow, you know, we've got keyboards where what you type is what you get. Uh, can we even fathom a technology in which an everyday user would be asked to memorize four digit ciphers for different for different codes? And so, over the course of the chapter, I follow that confusion, that that those debates over the limits of human capacity, all while also telling the story of this absolutely amazing 
uh, person, Lois Liu, who just has an incredible personal story, but also uh, an incredible career story when she joined IBM and became the main demonstrator for this prototype machine all over the United States and, on, and all over China in, in, in Gao Zhou Tsing's attempt to get this thing up and running and off the ground. And uh, she was sort of living proof that it was possible. But even in the face of this person, who had a very modest beginnings, did not wasn't a college graduate, wasn't a high school graduate, family torn apart by war, um, you know, uh, not someone that you would just assume like, oh, okay, this person holds three PhDs and honorary degrees and is, you know, a polyglot and so forth. Of course, this person, there's a they're a chess master. Of course, this person would know how to use it, but not just an average person. She was in her own way like a quintessentially the exact profile that um, Gao Zhongxing and others would have needed in order to hire and train typists at scale, people with modest middle school educations, high school educations. And she was living proof that it could be done. Uh, and what's amazing is that this machine was even much, 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 much harder than any human computer interface that I discuss in the rest of the book for one very simple reason, is that remember when I described how your MacBook Pro works or how a Windows machine works now, remember I talked about a pop-up menu. This pop-up menu that is giving feedback to the user saying, okay, based upon what you have entered on the keyboard, here is what I think you want and I'm giving you a chance to, to confirm that yes, this is what you want or to say, no, 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 that's not what I want. Lois Liu and others who use this machine had to input blind. There was no feedback mechanism. She either got the character right or got the character wrong. She either entered the correct four-digit cipher or not. And she was doing this literally on stage in front of journalists and diplomats and, and you know audiences of hundreds of people with incredible high stakes. You know, there's one footage. I have one, I have still frames in the, uh, in the, in the book of footage of her doing one of these demonstrations and Gao Zhong seen like they're nervously watching her. You could just fathom the stress that she was under and she was doing it. Um, and so it, it, it's sort of as a, as the opening of the book, it is the first electro automation of Chinese. It is the kind of one of the earliest conceptualizations of, of input. The first, I still credit to this other typewriter, the Ming Kui, which I talk about in the Chinese typewriter. But even more importantly, is that it gets at one of the primary questions, which I think readers of the book will 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 ask, even of the 2020s, which is, I mean, Tom, you've described how IMEs work. Can, can the average person do that? Can an average person interact with language and computers in that way? To the, the answer is, yes, billions of people interact with their computers in this way, not just in China, in the China-speaking world, the Japanese-speaking world, Korean and then again, the list goes on until we we are at basically 50% of the global population in some way, shape or form is dealing with human computer interaction in this fundamentally coded way. And so that's the, one of the big things that I was not expecting was it was an aha moment for me as I was doing this research. Yeah, it's certainly, you know, the, the prospect of memorizing 6,000 different codes that you then input is, uh, seems really complicated. It's also, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, it's, it seems to almost be foreshadowing, you know, the rise of predictive text and the way in which, you know, even today in, in uh, you know, English language text, you know, predictive text is something that people use all the time where they start typing a word, it gives it, do you want this word? Maybe this word. Okay. Typically this word will follow that one. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's interesting. And I certainly want to get more into that. We'll talk about, you know, th this, that notion of a predictive text and, this idea of the interface with computer, how it changes how we how we type, uh, but I also want want to talk about you know some of the early computers you mentioned uh, that the early IBM computer. I was wondering if you'd also talk about uh, the the Sinotype computer. Uh, what was this computer? How did it work? What were some of the other ones that you find interesting? Yeah, Sinotype is um, I I argue the first Chinese computer. It's the first. Uh... It's the, it, it is um, a system that is spearheaded by a professor of electrical engineering at MIT in the 1950s, uh, a man by the name of Samuel Caldwell, who interestingly enough did not speak or write a single word or character of Chinese, but sort of 
mid-career, I would say, became fascinated by the, the engineering puzzle of kind of mechanized, electro-automated, computerized Chinese by virtue of effectively just sort of lunchtime classroom and dinnertime conversations with his overseas Chinese students at MIT. So the, the family, um, the Caldwell family was close family friends with Joyce Chun, the the maker and editor of the one of the most famous Chinese cookbooks in the world, the Joyce Chun cookbook. Uh, and they would occasionally kind of host at their at their home students uh, for dinners. And there were a few students and one in particular who got to talking with Samuel Caldwell about Chinese writing. And so I think that, you know, Caldwell knew, like everyone t generally knows uh, by a certain point in their life, that Chinese has no alphabet. There is no there is no syllabary. There is no alphabet. Uh, there are characters. And so I think probably like many, Caldwell carried around the assumption in his mind that, oh, well, since there is no alphabet or syllabaries, my assumption is, is that there's also no, there's no one way to make a Chinese character. I guess you could literally put the pen down starting anywhere on the page and make a Chinese character because there's no spelling. There's no, you don't have to put C before A before T to spell the word cat. And the student um, he was talking to, students who were talking to, was like, nope, <laughs> that's not how it works. There, There is a routine order to how we write Chinese characters. It's called stroke order. You take three Chinese people, you put them down, give them the same character, and they will they will write it out in the same way. Uh, even though there is no there's no there's no alphabet. And something about that conversation in particular, probably the ground had been laid through other conversations, but something about that that in particular just lit him up, lit Kent Caldwell up. And he's like, wait a minute, there's there's a there's a spelling of Chinese, even though there's not a, there's a right way to spell Chinese, even though there's no letters. And they're like, yeah, you could think of it that way. And he is, uh, he was an expert in logical circuit design. He was a, he was a student of Vannevar Bush. Uh, he himself was the advisor to, to Huffman of, of Huffman coding fame. And so just sort of one thing led to the other. And he thought, well, if there is a routine way by which all Chinese speakers write Chinese characters, I could build a logical circuit for that. I could build a system that sort of exploits that routineness and maybe make the first ever computer for Chinese. And at, really at that moment, his career path changes. He starts to collaborate with a professor of Chinese at, um, at nearby schools, at Harvard, uh, also his colleagues at, at MIT. And sets out to create this this thing that will become the Sinotype or the ideographic composer. And basically, what it is is a computational system for a photo typesetting backend. So um, basically, we want a computational system that allows us to uh, to run a machine that will use photographic impressions to create a print master. This is a new technology coming out of France in World War II and then being pioneered in the East Coast. Um, and so he's like, okay, we're going to do this for Chinese, and we're going to use a QWERTY keyboard, literally a QWERTY keyboard to manage this whole thing. And so what's really fascinating about this is, um, is not just how he designed the machine, he and his colleagues designed it, but what they accidentally ended up discovering along the way. So long story short is uh, he undertakes, he and his colleagues undertake an analysis of the so-called Spellings. I'm doing that in scare quotes. The spellings of different Chinese characters. That is the strokes that are, out of which they're made. In what sequence? And he tries to figure out, how, you know, what is the what is the how long are characters in terms of spelling? How many strokes does it take? What strokes are most common? He does this whole analysis, and he he basically outfits a machine where exactly like input method editors today. Again, what you're doing when you push keys is you're not actually you're actually you're not actually typing those strokes on the page. You're not spelling a character the way we spell the word cat, C-A-T. Instead, once again, you are providing this system that they're building with criteria. You are telling the system, I want you to take the stroke spellings that I'm giving you, and I want you to find the corresponding full Chinese character in your memory and then bring it back to me. Um, and this is the first pop-up menu. There literally was a little kind of glass 
you know, glass cut display in which the system would present before being committed to photographic film, what character kind of matched what the user wanted. Uh, so it was the first pop-up um, kind of computational pop-up menu in history. Uh, and so, but then the real discovery to came next is, and I'll use the example, the example I use in the book is, uh, let's imagine you're spelling the word xylophone. Okay. In the Anglophone realm of what you type is what you get and spelling, there's only one way to spell xylophone. X, Y, L, O, P, H, O, N, E. And that's it. So however many letters that is, that's how you do it. Um, you could abbreviate, but that's not xylophone. That's an abbreviation of xylophone. If you think about this other mode of human machine and human computer interaction, though, where I'm not typing the letter X and Y and L in order to type these things, compose these things. I am giving it to a machine in order for the machine to find xylophone. So it's a retrieval process, a search process. What he discovered, and I think you can see where I'm going with here, is that if you are typing X, Y, L, L O, the computer is going to stop you and say, stop, 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 stop. I have what I need. There is like no other word you could be trying to find right now besides, I guess, xylophone, xylophones, plural, and maybe xylophonic. I don't know. Xylitol. Xylophony. <laughs> yeah, xylitol. So there's like suddenly this, 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 the, what we're doing is we're starting with the, the total possibility of a lexicon. And then each keystroke is reducing what could possibly be. So we're trying to reduce probability down to certainty or near certainty. And so what he ends up discovering is a distinction between what he calls the full spelling of Chinese characters, the total number of strokes in the right order, and then the minimum number of minimum spelling, which is the number of strokes that you need to enter before the computer says there's an absolute match, stop. And what he discovers is that sometimes it's like less than 50%. So he had inadvertently, he and his team had inadvertently invented auto-completion. Auto-completion is part of the very first Chinese computer in 1959, 1957-89. Uh, and in fact, they, they, were, they were like, once they discovered this, they literally rebuilt the machine such that when you reach the minimum spelling of your desired Chinese character, the keyboard would stop. The keyboard would lock up. It would not allow you to enter further keystrokes because why are we doing this? Um, and so the, this, um, within Sinotype, this idea of, they don't call it auto-completion, of course. He doesn't call it that, but the but auto-completion is a part of Chinese computing from basically that moment onward. So I don't know when people think auto-completion formally began in Anglophone computing. The 90s would be a very, very, very bold statement, but I think it's it really is more of a 2000s onward thing. Um, it has been around in, in Sinophone computing for decades and decades already. It's amazing. And it's, it's a, it's truly a brilliant, uh, approach to, to solving a problem. It's, it's, uh, and incredible that the person who sort of figured it out, didn't even speak, uh, Chinese at all, just purely yeah. through, uh, through using logic and his, his own knowledge of circuits. Pretty. Yeah. And it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive because, uh, and the way I try to put it in the book is, is it's a very counterintuitive idea of what, of mediation. So, I mean, the etymology of media is something that is in between something and something else. And so it stands to reason that the more mediation, the further something is away or the, or the longer it takes. If I, if I'm sitting in bed and, and it's cold, I put on more blankets between me and the cold air, and I'm further away from that coldness in some way. In this one, he had added multiple layers of mediation and inadvertently made the process much faster. And this is the basis of, this is one of the core ingredients, what I refer to as one of the axioms of Chinese computing, is that counterintuitively, the addition, additional layers of mediation accelerate the process, which for the average Anglophone computer user is like completely bonkers of an idea. But it is empirically demonstrable. So, uh, you know, after the the invention of the Sinotype, how did typing in Chinese evolve? Uh, you know, moving moving forward, you know, into the sixties and the seventies, did it start to uh, did it change? Did it take hold? 
uh, in a way where people were, you know, were, were really eager to, eager to learn or was there a, a, a bit of a, a slow process in taking hold? Oh, it's, I mean, it's a slow process for a variety of reasons. So, um, you know, I think that probably just like my former, my previous book, The Chinese Typewriter, the what justifies writing an entire book or spending some large portion of one's career on this is not a sort of Elizabeth Eisenstein, the history of print kind of justification that it changed the world, that it, you know, that the Gutenberg revolution literally changes the, the makeup and, 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 uh, um, complexion of the printed matter. It, it, that's not the story. Just like in typewriter, what I try to say is that what's amazing about it, it is that it was this molten core of linguistic and engineering and technological and entrepreneurial um, and conceptual kind of. It was like it was like a maelstrom of experimentation and and just and weirdness going on with it. And um, for the greater part of the story. It wasn't a story in which it changes economy, it changes government, it changes um, it changes people's everyday lives the way that classic stories of computing, I think, do, which always have a sort of impact model uh, for that justifies why am I studying the history of the Apple? It's because the, we know how big the Apple will become, and therefore, in this case, most of the story, most of the things I talk about in this book, just like in Typewriter, are failed prototypes. The Sinotype was never mass manufactured. The IBM machine was never mass manufactured, um, but they, but they still, they have incredible legacies because these things that were implemented, sometimes stumbled upon, sometimes purposely, deliberately developed, are still with us today, um, and so now we we can understand how we get to the place we are today for that. So I think in terms of an impact model of computing, this more classic model, that's that's really from the 70s onward. The first machine in the book where you can say this machine changed things was the IPX machine uh, by Ideograph, the company Ideographics developed by uh, the Taiwanese-American uh, inventor and, and his colleagues, um, Chen Ye. And this was a machine that it was a computational um, system. It was, a, again, a computational sort of printing system, but it also had all of these various subsystems of character generation and transmission. Uh, and once this machine was debuted as a commercial product, it began as a private military product. But once it debuted as a commercial product to the Taiwanese economy, uh, it completely changed the nature of newspaper publishing. It completely changed the nature of how the Taiwanese government issued like tax tax returns. It completely changed um, how uh, something as simple as like telephone yellow page books and directories were printed. So uh, that was the first one. He, and uh, he, Chen Ye was the, the only person in the book. Uh, well, the first person in the book, I think that we could, we could traffic in these sort of not otherwise sort of nonsense comparisons. Like this is the Steve Jobs of Asia. Like Chen Ye was probably the first person who might carry that badge if I were to use badges like that, which I don't, but um, had that kind of impact. And then his machine, his, his, his company, his device is sort of swallowed and doesn't survive the, the rise of software, the software revolution. He, he doesn't, he doesn't manage to bridge that gap. And he, as his company, um, eventually dies out, but, uh, in its day and age, it was an incredibly impactful machine. So just, just returning a little bit, just talking about the, the QWERTY style keyboard and the development of this, um, you write about it, it having a resurgence in the late late nineteen seventies. What happened? Yeah. So um, so when actually uh, this era of the IPX and the ideographics machine in developed over the late sixties into the seventies, this machine did not use a QWERTY keyboard. And in fact, there is um, there's a chapter in the book where I talk about Chen Ye and the IPX machine, but also a series of other kind of prototype um, Chinese computers that all of which shared one thing in common, which is that they all abandoned, for this period of about 10, 15 years, they all abandoned and rejected the QWERTY keyboard. And um, the idea was, is that, wow, you know, computational technology is, is changing. Microprocessor technology is changing. The sort of microcomputing revolution is making all, of, all sorts of new things possible. Let's exploit those new possibilities and let's try finally to make a keyboard that is truly Chinese, 
by which I mean a keyboard that would allow for the average Chinese computer user to enjoy the same what you type is what you get kind of experience as Anglophone counterparts. So I try to make the point in the book that despite the conceptual linguistic um, engineering marvels that I think IMEs are, input method editors are, there is never a moment in this history, not once, in which anyone celebrates IMEs or input method editors. There's never a moment, I don't know of anyone in the book, that lifts a flag and says, from this point on, all, you know, long live IMEs, long live input. There still is in the background, a background radiation of a presumed alphabetic supremacy, Latin alphabetic supremacy, that there is something still intrinsically superior of the idea of immediate what you type is what you get. And this, amazingly, this idea is still harbored by individuals who are living in a day and age when input far outstrips what you type is what you get, alphabetic typewriting. It is, it is faster than that. It is more efficient than that. But even in that day and age, there is by many a presumed supremacy of the Latin alphabetic mode of human computer interaction. So there is this one period though. It's a brief moment. It's not to say it will never happen again, but for the history, it's the it's 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 a unique moment in which people say, Thank the Lord, we now have tools at our disposal that allow us to delink ourselves from the QWERTY keyboard and all of these kind of um cumbersome, let's say, mediations of input. Now we can just develop a system. And so uh, you have the IPX system in Taiwan and then the United States. You have uh, these various experiments at Tsinghua University and elsewhere in mainland China with different shaped so-called medium-sized keyboards, large-scale keyboards. And it's a really fascinating era of um, where people, engineers all around the world, the UK started in Hong Kong. There's different sites of experimentation in Japan. In which people say, "Let's go back to the let's go back to the drawing board on human computer interaction itself. Let's go back. I mean, let's throw away something that has been with us since roughly you know the eighteen eighties, eighteen nineties, and certainly nineteen hundreds. The QWERTY style single shift keyboard. Let's throw it out the window and start over. And um, and it succeeds. I mean, like again, this is the era that gives us the IPX system by by Ideographics. So it's a huge commercial success. The other ones are prototypes. That's fine. But this is actually the first commercial success in the whole story. And then what ends up happening is there's a variety of things that happen. One of them undoubtedly is the reform and opening period under Deng Xiaoping after uh, Mao's death. This reignites the relationship between mainland China and the and capitalist economies all over the world and will begin this sort of trickle and then flood of QWERTY-based personal computers again. Uh, most of them are still way beyond the purchasing power of an average person, but work units are purchasing them, universities or whatever. And, um, and you know, this is one of the many factors that I talk about in the book, but I'll just explore that. Let's say now you are a, um, you're someone who, is interested in the question of Chinese computing. You're an inventor, let's say, and you're living in 1980 in Shanghai. And you you kind of face a fork in the road. Well, one is I'm seeing more of these machines, these 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 personal computers and computing shops that are cropping up over Beijing and Shanghai and elsewhere, and they're all using the QWERTY keyboard. And yes, I've heard maybe about these these alternative keyboards, I face a fork in the road. Do I want to get into the business of hardware design, systems engineering, literally manufacturing of these machines uh, that, are, that are bespoke and custom made? Or do I want to give QWERTY another look and use it as kind of my palette of colors to paint my painting? And I think at, an acro at, a, at a macro level, more and more of these inventors begin to say, okay, Let's look at the QWERTY keyboard as a starting point again, and let's harness the, the, the powers of microprocessing in a different way. And so you begin to see the, the, the sort of return, I would say, an explosion eventually of people inventing competing input systems that use the QWERTY keyboard as their starting point. One footnote here is none of them are using pinyin. None of them are using phonetic systems. All of them think that Han Yu Pinyin, the phonetic system for Romanizing Chinese, which has been around by this point, like say, it's been around since the mid 50s, is the worst, the single worst way that we could ever govern this input process for a variety of reasons I talk about in the book. 
And so all of the, with the return of QWERTY and the return of input really in the 1980s in a big way, and then eventually it's explosion, all of the characters in the story are using the letters of the Latin alphabet to describe the shape of Chinese characters that they want, not the sound of them. The story of the rise of pinyin, of phonetic input, is a, really a 1990s story onward. Uh, but for the, the greater part of the history I talk about in the book, structure reigns supreme. The structure of the Chinese character is what we are trying to describe to the computer, not its sound. So looking at you know some of the, the methods that were developed in that period in the, in the 90s too, what are the, the major methods that you think are important for listeners to know about? Yeah, I mean, I try to... I, I, there are so many. By the end of the story, there are over 1,000 uh, different, 1,000 documented input methods that exist. Uh, so for any listeners who are into the history of computing, the closest equivalent that you could think of is programming languages. You know, like the that from the 60s onward, there's, you know, COBOL, ALGOL, C++, Java, Python, like, and all of these things that other, other people haven't heard of. Um, that's That's the way to think about IMEs that they just start to proliferate with different programming languages, so to speak, but in this case, input methods. Um, in the, from the, from the, well, I, I make the, the argument in the Chinese typewriter, which is sort of the segue, the bridge chapter to the Chinese computer, that Lin Yutong's Ming Kuai Chinese typewriter is really the first input system. Um, so if we take that as a starting point, 1947, all the way to say, arbitrarily, let's say 1990, the first, uh, what is that, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 50, you know, five decades, plus or minus a few years, um, input is governed by structure. So everyone who is inventing input systems, everyone is, is inventing a different logic of input, but all of them are using structure as their starting point. And then so then if you kind of click down into that folder, <laughs> um, you have subfolders or different approaches to it. So... Uh, there are, I'll give you some examples. So there's a whole class of structure-based input systems that you could almost think of as uh, they are samples, they're samplers. So what I mean by that is, imagine that you have a Chinese character on a piece of paper in front of you, and then imagine that you have another piece of paper that has kind of holes cut out in it. And you lay that kind of like Swiss cheese and you lay that piece of paper over top of the character and all of the character is obstructed from view except for the pieces you can see through the, the Swiss cheese holes. And then you're going to look at those two or three or four holes and whatever structural features are peeking up through those holes. And then you are assigning some sort of categorical value to what you are seeing. Is it an angle? Is it a stroke? Is it thick? Is it thin? Is it, um, there's, is it, there's a variety of ways that we could categorize what we're seeing. And then we're going to take those categories and we're going to assign each of those categories a letter of the Latin alphabet or a number. What that means is, is that all Chinese characters will end up having a three letter, a four letter, a two letter, you know, depends on how you approach it code where each code, each letter or number in the code is referring to the taxonomic value of the structural feature that is peeking out through that Swiss cheese hole. And so three corner coding, there's one very, very famous one, um, Sanjiao, it's called three corner coding. It is a Swiss cheese model, a kind of sampler model. And as you could guess from the name of the, the, the input system, three corners, it's taking samples at the three of the four corners of the square shape of a Chinese character. And then the numbers that one assigns to it is based upon how the input method editor inventor decides to do it. So I don't want any listener to kind of get like, oh my gosh, get lost in that so much as to say something very basic about what I just said, which is this is arbitrary. There could be three corners. There could be four corners. There could be two corners. It could be not corners at all. It could be centers or sides or tops and bottoms. Um, it could be a corner and a top. It could be... So what you decide to sample and how many you decide, how many samples you take is completely up to the inventor to decide. And even after you decide on that, how you end up describing categorically what you see through each of those Swiss cheese holes is also arbitrary. 
Um, you could do it on the basis of angles or stroke thickness or anything you want, really. And then the assignment of each of those categorical values to the letters of the Latin alphabet or to Arabic numerals is also how you map that relationship is also arbitrary. So what this leaves you with is something that I try to explore in the book, which I find almost uh, almost um, dizzying if you really stop and think about it. Is that the moment? Is that input is infinite? There are a theoretically infinite number of ways that you could map out the relationship of the letters of the QWERTY keyboard to the input process. Only some, only so many of you know, only a subset of that infinite potential set have have actually ever been done. You know, have actually ever been developed and 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 put down in a patent document, or whatever. But the field is infinite. It's a theoretically infinite space. And so what this means is that, if to back it up a step, the moment, and I mean the moment that human-computer interaction moves from a strategy of immediacy, what you type is what you get, typing as composition, impression equals, depression of a key equals impression, depression equals impression, like a mechanical typewriter. The second we move from that framework to a framework in which what we're really doing is search writing. Sinotype use the keys, Caldwell uses the keys in the Sinotype to conduct a search process for something in memory. The electric Chinese typewriter by IBM, you do not push the numbers in order to see those numbers. You push it to govern a search process to return one of the values on this metal drum. And an input method editor today, when you touch B-E-I-J-I-N-G, what you're doing is you're you're conducting a search process, a retrieval process in order to write. So you could think of input as search writing. The moment that you make the transition from one to the other, what opens up is an infinitely large space of potential experimentation. Infinitely large. There is an, there's, no fine, there's no limit to how you govern that relationship. And that's what this book is. is like a first, I just sort of peek my head through the door into this new infinite zone. It's a very scary sort of, it's like looking down, you know, at the edge of the, I don't know, the Grand Canyon or something or a bottomless well or whatever. It's, there's something kind of exciting and scary about it. And what this book is, is just, I'm going to go about, I don't know, a hundred feet <laughs> into this new space and just take out my piece of paper and map out the terrain. But the terrain is infinite. Uh, it's, it, it is, I mean, it's infinite to the point where it doesn't even have to be keys on a keyboard. It can be wearables and haptics and gestures and, uh, you know, what you use in order to provide the criteria for this computational search process could be, could be the sweat on your brow. It could be the furrows, wrinkles on your skin, um, gesture, anything. And so this space of search writing that's why I try to make the claim in the book that uh, this is not just a, a, another chapter in the history of technology. It, it is that, but uh, we are in, to use a Gutenberg sort of style word, I think we are in the incunabula period, the first 50 years of an entirely new epoch of, of writing, what it is, how it works, what it means. In the last 30 years with the, the uh, you know, as you say, maybe this... Uh kind of period where the recognition that all of these different type ways of typing Chinese was realized. Has there been a, let's say, a sort of a natural selection where some methods have become the preferred methods? Um, where are we today? What, you know, percentage wise, yeah. if you know? No, definitely. There is definitely a, a, a selection process. There is all the stuff that we think about as, as uh, historians of technology, you know, why did the whole like Betamax versus VHS, the whole, uh, you know, Apple versus this operate this operating system versus that operate. It's a, it's, it, that's where the more classic conventional stories of, of market dominance kick in. Some, I mean, you have, <clears throat> you know, you have certain systems like, um, Wubi, so Wubi input, which is a structure based input, one of the most, um, commercially successful input systems of a certain era. And a lot of people will make the claim um, that it wins because it was the best. And undoubtedly, you know, the speed and efficiency of a system 
undoubtedly has an impact on its uptake. But it's also because the inventor of Wubi was like a relentless self-promoter. He was like the most entrepreneurial person. He would have had nine TikTok channels and a, and a drop shipment thing and a channel. He would make me look like a like a like a like a rookie by comparison. You know, he was schmoozing using his whole Rolodex to try to get his system in front of people. He was, you know, beaten, hitting the pavement. Um, and so, and then, but he, he literally published newspapers. He would start newspapers, periodicals that would claim to be about just computing in general, which was basically a long form infomercial for his stuff. I mean, so, you know, and then if you were to sit down with him and say, you know, why is your system so successful? His answer would have been, well, it's efficient, you know, it's intuitive to use, you know, he would have ruled out all of that extra stuff that was being done. And then there are just weird accidents that I talk about in the story, uh, these sort of accidents of history, like um, uh, to, to use the example of Sanzia, so Three Corner. Three Corner was pretty popular in Taiwan, um, in computing circles, but also in library circles, like, because again, this is a retrieval. IMEs are really... Um, they are retrieval technologies like along the lines of card catalog lookup systems and so forth, dictionary lookup systems. And so, you know, why is it that the Wang Laboratories, very famous company in the day and age, why did Wang Labs for its ideographic word processor division, which was its attempt to break into the China market, why did it use Sanxiao? Why did they choose that? Did it undertake, did the engineers undertake a full-scale market analysis of competing IMEs and do user testing? No. The engineer who was in charge of it, a brilliant engineer, um, Jenny Chuang, who was one of the earliest um, um, women computer scientists to be in charge of a major operating system development at Wang Labs for English, in fact, uh, she was put in charge by Wang An of the ideographic team. And she went to her church and where there were like other, pe other like um, people of her, her Chinese uh, Christian church that were also engineers working for like DEC Corporation and others, she kind of poached them over to come over to Wang Labs. And in Taiwan, they were all Taiwanese of Taiwanese descent. And the the retrieval input system that they were just familiar with because it was popular in Taiwan was uh, was three corner. And so but maybe there was maybe a one or two other contenders, although I don't even think that was true. They just picked it. They picked it. And so there's these, you know, these weird accidents of history that happened. But yeah, so out of this, out of this thousand plus world of, you know, th this world of thousand plus IMEs and input systems that have been documented, that we have records that these existed, there's probably a handful of maybe two dozen that end up being um, somewhat, you know, commercially viable, somewhat commercial, popular. They were, they achieve the distinction of becoming, of coming preloaded, kind of like now we do have IMEs that come preloaded on store-bought computers. Uh, some of these IMEs made it into that preloaded set that would come like when you installed the operating system with uh, CC DOS, which was a, a, a Chinese clone of, of the DOS operating system. The 10 um, input systems or something like that came preloaded. And if you, top, you know, push function key one or two or three, it would load up one of these different ones. So huge. This is like getting your font. If you're a type designer, getting your font in one of the preloaded menus in Microsoft Word. Um and so over time, there is this winnowing process of commercially viable versions. And then in the 90s, you 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 have the juggernaut of phonetic systems. And so from the 90s onward, the whole field of play of Chinese input changes dramatically with the rise of phonetic input. And then really the, the personnel of Chinese input, the companies of Chinese input, the logic of Chinese input changes um, dramatically from that point onward. So what has been the impact of phonetic? Uh, it's obviously, uh, you know, very, you know, like, like we've been discussing, it, it's counterintuitive, you know, it's um, uh, using a, 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 a different uh, alphabet or different uh, set of, of characters uh, to speak another language doesn't seem, seem necessarily like the obvious uh, outcome. Um, but you know what are some of the the advantages of phonetic uh, and how is phonetic uh, Im impacting how how people interact with the Chinese language? Yeah, yeah. No, that was a that was a very um, I was 
very hesitant. You know, I knew that pinion and phonetic input was sort of looming in the background of this project the entire time. And I knew I would have to eventually wrestle with this bear. And I, I to be honest, I wasn't really looking forward to it because um, it, it would seem to pull one into all of these other discussions that are seemingly related, but actually not having to do with like the long history of romanization for Chinese and these ongoing debates about you know, phoneticization and so forth. Uh, but I ended up, that ended up being one of the, the most exciting parts of the research process was a, just learning just how long engineers thought of phonetic input as the worst of all possible solutions. Uh, they were looking at it in the face and say, nah, um, also figuring out the the sort of micro tectonics of how pinion became viable, how phonetic input became, came viable, which is an interesting story that I try to deal with. But then once you get to the place where it's dominant, when and where it's dominant, there are, I mean, there's at least two huge uh, implications for the story. The first one is a national story, and the second one is more of a technical story. So the first one is that with the rise, simply put, a speaker of one of the many Chinese languages, sometimes referred to as dialects, that are mutually unintelligible in some case, a speaker of any of the many Chinese languages can use a structure-based input system because the writing system is equal across these different these different um, so-called Chinese dialects. So if I'm a Cantonese speaker, I can use Wubi to type Chinese on my computer, and I don't need to learn anything about the standard pronunciation, so to speak, of that character. With phonetic input, Phonetic input being based on Han Yu Pinyin, which itself is based on this so-called standard dialect of Chinese, means that one way, shape, or form, I have to either learn or be deeply familiar with the with the, the, the national standard for the Chinese language. So, Chinese phonetic input serves a nationalistic purpose. It serves a purpose. Uh, um, it 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 pulls in the same direction uh, towards an ambition that goes back to state Chinese state regimes and, and leaders and state planners all the way back to the Qing dynasty of unifying the Chinese language. Uh, so that's that's one huge implication for the move from structure-based to phonetic-based input. Yes, there are Cantonese input systems that use Cantonese phonetic values, but they're very rarely used. They're sort of sundry. The, all of the standard, off-the-shelf, most powerful phonetic input systems all use the standard Chinese pronunciation as their basis. Um so that is that's a sea change in this, but that comes with it um, a kind of also democratization to it, meaning that it's um, some some would say will jump to the conclusion that phonetic Chinese input is somehow intrinsically easier than say a structure based input system, to which I would respond, mm, not so fast. We have to remember that. Um, phonetic Chinese input systems are based on Hanyu Pinyin. And Hanyu Pinyin is taught to Chinese kids from like age three or four onward. Literally, the entire Ministry of Education throws untold trillions of dollars towards inculcating every new generation of Chinese learners into the system of Hanyu Pinyin. Education, textbooks, television, radio, you know, publication... Let's imagine a world in which, for some strange reason, the People's Republic of China invested trillions of dollars in training every Chinese uh, schoolgoer of Wubi and taught nobody Han Yu Pinyin, which one would be, quote unquote, easier then? Uh, it, so it's an unfair comparison if one takes Wubi input, a structure-based input, any structure-based input out of the box and then compares it with Han Yu Pinyin because any Han Yu Pinyin-based phonetic input system quite literally has the entire Ministry of Education of the People's Republic of China behind it. Uh, and so it's not a simple, it's not, it's, it really isn't, uh, I'm, I'm happy to go to the mat with anyone in the audience who's like, oh no, it, it just really isn't as simple a, a story as that, oh, because it's phonetic, it's, it's easier. It's just, it's, that's to me very um, underdeveloped thought. Uh, but undoubtedly, because of the fact that literally the entire educational system of the People's Republic of China is in effect preparing people to at least understand the rules of phonetic input, that undoubtedly it opens the door to more people using it. Um, and so 
it is both interestingly nationalistic and centralizing and in some way democratizing of the, of the computational experience. That you could say is the trade-off. It opens the door, but to walk through this door, you've got to be interacting with the Chinese language in its so-called standard form as defined by the state. On a technical side, and something that I really like, and it's not obvious at all, is that the move from f structure to phonetic input completely changes the um, the complexion of the of inventors. Short put, to put it shortly, the people, the kind of people who invent and patent structure based input systems are, by and large, eccentrics. In a Japanese circle, they would be called otaku. These are people that literally either spend their retirement years or sometimes quit their jobs to sit in a room with surrounded by Chinese dictionaries and over years and years and years of intellectual labor, try to, you know, break them apart and under and sort of discover these underlying rationales, whether natural or artificial. And then oftentimes they themselves are not even the ones that have programming chops. They often have to like pair up with somebody else who knows how to program and says, okay, can you basically turn this system into an input method editor? So it's a place for hobbyists, eccentrics, lovers of language, amateurs. Um, and of course, yes, engineers, it's not that you don't have to be that, but there's space for lots of people like that in that story. Phonetic based input system is not something you can do by hanging out in your room for 20 years with a copy of the Kangxi Dictionary. You basically need to have a degree in mathematics. You basically are, you you really need to be up on stochastic reasoning, you know, um, algorithms, probability theory, applied statistics, it, because the whole thing really is not, a, um, you as the inventor, you don't have the luxury of inventing a completely fabricated approach the way that like three corner does or Wubi does or others you kind of have to start with the world as it is which is the pronunciation of chinese characters in pinyin form that's your starting point and then what sets your phonetic input system against any of your competitors is the speed of your algorithm the refinement of your statistical reasoning, all of these other computational processes that are layered on top of it. And those are, for lack of a better word, something that you basically need a, a degree in. It's not an amateur thing anymore. And and more than that, it's not a charismatic thing anymore. It's, it's built by teams of mathematicians and applied statisticians and Bayesian logic thinkers and you know so forth. And so it's built by teams, it, generally in companies, Google, you know, Microsoft, QQ, Sogo, Tencent, others. Tell me, you know, there is no person you can point at at Tencent and say, this was the inventor of the IM, this IME system. But in the previous age, that was easy. Who invented Sanjiao? There's an answer for that. Who invented, uh, you know, Wubi? There's an answer for that. Who's Who invented X, Y? And it's often a charismatic kind of entrepreneurial figure. And also very often very ego. Let's say the, the, these individuals had very healthy egos. And now it's a it's a team. It's very technical. Uh, it's it, and so in some way an, a whole era, uh, this sort of era of amateurs is is over, uh, at least in the market dominant input systems. Every year though, people still patent new structure based input systems. To this day, like as we're as we're talking, as we're having this conversation, I would bet a thousand dollars that there is someone in their room right now with a Chinese dictionary making a structure based input system, um, but it's just no longer the market dominant approach to the problem. I want to return to something that you talked about at the very beginning: this experience of being in a bookstore and finding uh, a dictionary of forgotten or rare yeah. Chinese characters. Yeah. Uh, with the, the the move to digital, are we seeing more rare characters being forgotten? Uh, has there, you know, maybe been a silver lining where there have been, you know, new uh, things created, rediscovered that it's actually heartening for the language? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there is, generally speaking, a heartening trajectory 
to the problem of um, inclusion and exclusion, certainly. I mean, so this goes all the way back to my first book, The Chinese Typewriter. The mass manufactured Chinese typewriters had a maximum, or the, the main very famous brand, the Double Pigeon, had a maximum of 2,450 characters that it could fit on the tray bed. And so 2,450 is a small fraction of the total number of Chinese characters. Same thing is true of the Chinese telegraph code. Chinese telegraph code from 1871 has a small subset. And the same thing is true in early computing. Um, I try to talk about in one chapter in the Chinese computer that simply a digital font at the outset of personal computing, a digital font for just a few thousand Chinese characters would be equal, more, would be larger than the entire memory capacity of, say, an Apple. I mean, forget the operating system, forget any program applications, just a digital phone for a subset of Chinese characters would be greater than the total available memory of these systems. And so for the greater part of the story that I talk about in Chinese typewriter and the Chinese computer is that it's an incredibly exclusive space. There's just spatial, literally spatial limitations of the telegraph code book, of the, of the typewriter, and then these material virtual spaces of memory for the greater part of the story means that we just can't do it. As memory becomes cheaper and cheaper and as processing speeds get faster and faster, the boundaries of it, now you can, in theory, fit the entire Chinese lexicon and digital fonts and multiple digital fonts on our laptops because our laptops right now are by 1980 standards, quite literally, I'm not joking, supercomputers. They, they surpass the definition of what a supercomputer used to be defined as in, say, the 80s and 90s. And so it's, it's, it's you know, there is a heartening story where, at the very least, certain things of very hardcore exclusion um, is are diminishing. And yet, the, the, the less than heartening, the disheartening story is that um, at the aggregate level, if we sort of zoom out, not just from Chinese script, but to the world of, say, non-Roman, non-Latin scripts, digital exclusion is still the norm, not the, it's the rule, not the exception. I just started a, a program with my colleagues at Stanford called Silicon, which is the Stanford in, uh, Initiative on Language Conservation of Old and New Media. It's along, basically, it's, it's focused on advancing uh, digital inclusion for digitally disadvantaged languages, DDLs. And this is beyond Chinese. This is um, writing systems living in and extinct from, from globally, globally. The Unicode Consortium, I think, categorizes something like 97-ish percent of all living languages are technically digitally disadvantaged by various measures. It's just, so digital in exclusion, if Chinese was arguably the first major digitally ex excluded language that through, through the kinds of processes I try to map out in these two books was steadily included um, at, at, at an aggregate level of global language, Exclusion is still the rule, um, and inclusion the the exception. But uh, but back to the point. I mean, I think what the digital age does is, and what what I talk about in the book as hypography does is, it changes it changes the nature. It kind of changes the rules of language change itself. So it is part of, for lack of a better word, the the evolution of technology, but it's also a rewriting of the rule book by which evolution of language itself happens. And I can give you, I can give you a, a very specific example of this. So the lowercase letters of the Latin alphabet, many, some listeners will already know this story. The lowercase a comes from the uppercase a. So effectively, what long story short, if you write the letters, if you write the uppercase A a trillion times, and your one goal is to reduce the number of times you lift the pen off the page, you will eventually get to the lowercase A. Same thing happened to other lowercase letters of the alphabet. And incidentally, for viewers or listeners that will be thinking about East Asia, that's where hiragana comes from. Hiragana comes from the steady calligraphic degradation of Chinese characters. Basically, you take the character an, meaning peaceful, peace or something like that. And if you calligraphically do it, you know, produce it a trillion times, where the goal is to not lift the brush off the page, you will eventually get to the kana letter, the kana syllable that it then do. 
but so this is this is sort of you know these are these weird quasi rules of how writing has has been transformed over thousands and thousands of years but now something has changed which is uh all of those rules were operating in in what i you know i i think clumsily i'm trying to talk about it's the orthographic age this is an age where what you type is what you get where you in order to write something you're literally writing it you're you're you are impressing something in clay you're etching it in stone you're you're it's comp it's it's writing as composition once we start to play in this new realm of hypography where writing is not composition it's retrieval then uh something changes and you could think of it this way if i write let's say imagine a world in which i write uh the lowercase a this sort of calligraphic quick a on a on a tablet on a trackpad where the goal is not to actually produce that symbol but to tell the machine i want you to find the letter that i'm looking for which is the capital a if we imagine an alternate world that's governed by that logic where i'm not writing the letter a i'm searching for the letter a the lowercase alphabet would not exist because again think about what happens in the input process the second that the the, the program finds the symbol that the user wants and the moment that the user says yes that's the one i want what they actually wrote on the tablet or on the keyboard disappears and this is where disappearance comes back in it is not recorded it is not meant to exist any longer than it has to and so in a theoretical alternate universe kana would not exist the lowercase alphabet would not exist all of those would have existed ephemerally purely for the purpose of producing the symbol or retrieving the symbol we want which is the chinese kanji the kanji character or the uppercase letter so that what i'm getting at here is we don't i don't have an answer for this but what i'm very confident about is that as we set foot as we're in the incunabula of this new age this hypographic age the it is a new chapter in the history of writing but it's also seems to be re rewriting the logic by which subsequent chapters will will need to be written. I just want to ask because, you know, you've, you've written, uh, you know, about the typewriter, Chinese typewriter, you've done Chinese computer. I, I imagine you're, you're not done uh, with this line of inquiry. <laughs> uh, I think I'm done. I think, I don't know. I, I, I am working on a book that is, that is related to technology and, and, um, and writing, but I, I really admire people who spend their career Careers mining, you know, a certain arena. They've really they've they've invested a tremendous amount of time to developing subject expertise. They're gonna they have archives and so forth. I um I am a servant of my problem, and if my problem changes, it I am bound. I'm like a surf. I'm just I'm duty bound to just follow this problem where it goes. And what I will say is, these two books. Like the Chinese separator, the Chinese computer, are the manifestations of 15 years of really serving and trying to figure out a problem that I carried around with me. But I also have to be honest to myself first and foremost, but then to other people because I want. I say this because I, to the extent that it's helpful for someone who's about to hear what I'm about to say and be like, "Oh wow, that's kind of like what I'm going through," and it's comforting to hear someone else say this is it it has lost its grip on me it's not gone i haven't solved it i ha it doesn't go poof it's just if anyone no one can see what i'm doing right now but i'm i'm holding my arm my wrist as tightly as possible and over time its grip has has loosened um i can look at the this problem and have almost a critical distance from it that i couldn't when i started this and what that tells me is that while it would make a perf it would be perfectly strategically career wise logical to continue down this path, I could talk to any editor at any publisher I want, say I kind of want to do the next thing, and show them these two books. I wouldn't have to. I would. I, I have all the subject expertise I need for from to last a lifetime, and I could just. Uh, but I can feel um, that my my time with this problem is either coming to an end or is done, and so it's time to move somewhere else that doesn't mean language will go away or you know technology won't show back up and certainly china and certainly um this time period but what it does mean is that if 
some or all combina of those combinations do show up in a future project, it will not be motivated by the same problem. I think that's pretty fair. To, that's a good pro prognostication, I think, has a good chance of coming true. Well, you've done you know an immense amount of work that anyone who wanted to pick up the baton uh, and carry it forward a little bit would certainly be able to uh, with with what you've left here. Uh, and I and I think you know your book it, it really does uh, butt up against the present. So as time unfolds, I'm sure there will be uh, new things that occur that might draw you back in, or will be something that another person uh, can can pick up on. Um, you know, I, I really appreciate this uh, this conversation that we had. I think you've you've obviously you, you you've delved into this topic in a way um, that really just explodes it and and asks more questions uh, than answers, really, which is is always a great a great thing. Uh, so I just want to thank you so much, Tom, for for being guest on the, the New Books Network. I truly appreciate it, and thank you for all the great work that you do. I mean you you are the you you are the front door to the work of so many scholars. And I know from a fact how much they appreciate it. And also on the side of anyone listening, I, 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 I know full well how much your work is, is admired and appreciated. So, uh, the admir I, I send back the admiration in, in a hundredfold because this is really a great thing that you do. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I absolutely love the new books network and it, what makes it worthwhile is the, uh, you know, the, the, the hosts, the guests, the the listeners, uh, just the, the community. It's a very supportive uh, and and wonderful community. Uh, I, th I think before signing off, Tom, I know you're you know you're always working on on different things. I was wondering if you could share a little bit about uh, you know upcoming projects that you have, or or just really anything else that you think uh, you know for listeners that might want to follow up uh, with you or or see what it is that you're working on. Yeah, um, I. I'm not sure why I made this mistake many years ago to start to work on more project, more than one project at a time, but uh, I'm working on more than one project at a time right now. And so, uh, I mean, I guess maybe rather than sharing them all, uh, I would just say I, I really do love uh, getting emails, just hearing from people saying, you know, this is what I'm working on or what I'm worried about and just wanted to talk to someone about it or get some sounding board or whatever. And, uh, and, you know, I'm on Twitter X or whatever it's called now and LinkedIn and stuff. So I really do welcome, honestly, welcome just making contact. And then perhaps out of whatever conversation comes of that, then I think it's relevant to share, you know, next projects because they're, 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 they are of very different directions. And I, I would hate to come across as completely scattered, especially if any of my editors are, are listening and being like, Oh gosh, we're never going to see that book. You will see the books. I promise. I promise. I promise. Uh, uh, but there's just something about my brain that needs to, um, I have created a, I have created a procrastination logical circuit where technically speaking at any minute of the day, I'm not working on what I said I was going to work on, but I am working on other things. I'm not watching Netflix. Uh, I am doing it. And so at, at the aggregate level, I fulfill my whatever preternatural need to procrastinate while also getting the same quantity of work done on every one of those sub projects. I just have this, I just get that the teenage delight of being contrarian to myself of saying no to mom and dad, but where I'm mom and dad and the kid uh, all wrapped up into one playing this ridiculous teenage game. Um, so this is to say, you know, at any given moment, it looks like I'm, writing but what i'm secretly doing is writing naughtily on the thing that i is not in my eye cow at that particular moment uh that would be my one <laughs> if anyone out there has created this mental model for themselves i would love to meet you and hear how it's going for you uh and why the heck you built it because uh, that would give me some insight on where my brain came up with this idea um maybe that's a good way to close out yeah, I feel like I, I know a lot of actually extremely productive people that that operate in that way, uh, and there is a a chaotic uh, order to it. Um, yeah, you know, it doesn't it, doesn't feel good. Doesn't feel no. good, but it works. It works. So. Well, thanks so much, Tom, for being a guest. Thank you so much, and I'll talk to you soon.